I guess I was about a year or a year and a half crawling all over the floor, my grandmother's kitchen floor, and she called me in German a cooking spoon because I was into everything. So she had the most unmitigated, rotten childhood of anyone. Her mom was always an invalid from the day she was born, and, and they blamed her birth on her mom's illness, and she lived with that, and it built her passion and anger and always dis disbelieving what people in charge told her from the earliest days. My mother died when I was 16, and uh, I feel that she sent my husband to me because he was a prince. My husband, who died in 2000, I met him on the Manhattan Project. He was an atomic scientist. He had just graduated from Yale. He supported me every inch of the way. There were so many times that I said, I can't take this anymore. He was the one that said, get in that university and find out when the blankety blank is going on around here. And like a good wife of the 60s, I did what I was told. <laughs> he is so proud of me, and he's responsible for everything that's happening anyhow. He knows all about this. She was the kind of mother who, if your child is ill, there is nothing else. There's no diversion. I guess one could describe my defining moment in 1960, when I was sitting in the office of a leading pediatric gastroenterologist at New York Cornell Medical Center, he was planning for my eight-year-old daughter to have surgery to remove her colon for ulcerative colitis. By the time she was three and a half, four years old, the, the real fun began. Herb and I were sitting downstairs one night. She had been put to bed an hour before and we heard an earth-piercing shriek, and we ran up to find this four-and-a-half-year-old child standing up in her bed with her eyes wide open, perspiration streaming down her face, thrashing at her own demons. With those terrors, those night seizures that I still could actually draw for you, they are so clear in my mind, so vivid, those third-party crazy seizures at night. We tried to control her so she wouldn't throw herself down the steps. And after an hour, she, well, we brought smelling salts up trying to bring her to, but she was not seeing us. We brought her dog up. She did not see her dog. She was in some kind of another world. She repeated this maybe four times a week. Four and a half months later, the same child awakened at two o'clock in the morning, rushed to the bathroom, with a tummy ache and sat there on the toilet. And when I went to flush the toilet, it was filled with blood. Here we were now, just about ready to give up. Nothing was working and her colon was going to have to be removed. And I remember I sat there crying and this man turned to me and said, what are you crying about? You have done this to her. And I guess I locked my bedroom door, and I cried and cried. And this friend, whom I did not know, said, you tell your friend Elaine the minute she can to call me, and I will give her the name of the doctor who saved our twins. They were born celiac, and they were going to die. And within 48 hours, he did not keep us waiting. My husband and Judy and I rushed into his office in New York City, Park Avenue, 92nd Street. Now, don't you go there looking for him now. <laughs> he was 92 years old at the time. <laughs> he gave her a thorough examination, and then he sat me down, and he said those very famous words, Mrs. Gottschall, what are you feeding this child? In less than 10 minutes, he gave me the outline of the specific 
carbohydrate diet. Number one, she cannot have fluid milk. The second thing he told me was that she could not have any table sugar. He said, but she can have honey. The third thing he told me was a humdinger. <laughs> I guess you haven't heard that word for a long time. <laughs> What do the cool people call it now? <laughs> what he told me was that she could absolutely have no potatoes, no rice, no grains. According to Dr. Haas, she could have all the other vegetables, and she could have all the eggs and protein and other foods that are in, included in the normal diet. We put Judy on the diet, and I am telling you, within 48 hours, the night seizures, they went never to return. Well, the diet worked for me, you know, right away. If I had to sit there for six hours to get the last bite of the third banana in, then we would sit there for six hours, and if it took us till two in the morning, that's who my father was. And I just finished my breakfast this morning, which was a banana, ironically. Did this illness affect our entire family and every individual in it, you know, irreparably? Mom turned it into a wonderful thing. Mucosa, where these digestive enzyme cells with their enzymes are residing, they get sloughed off and new ones move up. So that is easily repairable. There have been children with epileptic seizures that are much older, and a few days on the diet, the seizures go away, so it's working on the brain. When it comes to things like eye contact and stimming, sometimes within two weeks they start improving. Parents who have never seen a formed bowel movement uh, sometimes wait two weeks for that, sometimes a month. Some of the, they've given the name trophies to them, and parents take pictures of these <laughs> movements which they've never seen in their whole lives. Mom was a really huge person, and she was intense. When you see a miracle happening, you see a child starting to talk sentences when he has never done that, you'd have to be retarded not to continue, I would think. If we do not digest our food properly, it is not going to be innocuously flushed down the toilet. It is going to go through the world of microflora, bacteria and yeast. And it goes through this world of bacteria and yeast. It is doing harm for the simple reason that these bacteria and yeast use this undigested food and produce many byproducts which have been shown to be injurious to the brain, as well as the rest of the body. A starch is actually chains of sugar molecules, thousands of them. And if that starch molecule, for example, is not broken down properly, it cannot be absorbed. There is no way that we can feed the rest of our body unless our food is digested so that it can be absorbed. If it is not digested, broken down, and it is not absorbed, it goes to the lower part of the gastrointestinal tract. You see it marked as the colon. And it is attacked by the, the microflora down there, the bacteria and yeast. They are looking for energy as well. What do they use their energy for to make babies? The sugars, as you can see, in, in fruit and honey, really don't require much digestion. Most of them are in the form of pre-digested carbohydrates already. If, for every, whatever reason, those res residues of starch or lactose or sucrose do not get split, the bacteria and yeast jump in and, as a result, produce carbon dioxide gas, bloating, bloating, hydrogen gas, bloating, methane gas, even alcohol. And of course, why are they doing all this? Because they want to make babies. See how tightly these three cells are sticking to each other. They're bound together the way Velcro would bind things together. And if they are loose, then you have leaky gut. Guess what the main reason is for the opening of the tight junctions which would cause leaky gut? Overgrowth of bacteria. This is a scanning three-dimensional picture, only 57 times normal, of the normal controlled child. You see the ridges are all of uniform shape. Um, you don't see much mucus there. This is a child, the same magnification, 
that has soy protein intolerance, and you already can see strands of mucus. Oh boy. 560, chronic diarrhea, large areas of intestinal surface are covered with thick and tenacious appearing mucus. Only the outlines of the villus ridges are visible. The child was clinically intolerant to lactose and sucrose. Once they took the enzymes out and put them in a test tube, the enzyme activity was normal. But what good was it? The enzymes on that surface could not make contact with the, with the work they were supposed to do. They have a physiological addiction to the, what the bacteria and the yeast are screaming for, which is sugar from the starch. All starch is, is indigestible sugar. You cannot get commercial food to the market with any shelf life without putting in a lot of things that aren't very good for us. How to get doctors on board? There's only one way, and that is for you parents to keep mobilizing and doing it and showing them results. And forget about the doctors. They are trained in crisis intervention, and they are trained very well to keep us from dying. And we cannot expect them, unfortunately, to know about health. So we just have to do this on our own and keep mobilizing and moving. They'll come around. I know how hard it is because I've been through it. Just keep tough and take one day at a time. It's hard work, but oh, it's going to be the most rewarding thing that you'll ever remember doing for your child. I said, who's going to carry on this work? And she pointed to this little boy who was about six years old. And I said, well, you know, we can't put our hopes in our children. They'll go into various directions. She said, don't you think that? She said, she just tells everybody that I cannot have, that he says to people, I cannot have double sugars. My intestine can't handle double sugars. I get sick when I eat them. I have to have single sugars. So